came in this morning and um, my friend Sam back there in the next to the last row says, well, I see we're in Samuel again. <laughs> Thanks for the encouragement, Sam. <laughs> yeah. You probably know that a couple of weeks ago we moved. My wife and I moved in with my middle son and his wife and three kids. Yeah, that's what I thought. <laughs> six out of seven of us were sick this week. <laughs> yeah, what a blessing, amen. <laughs> but you know, there are blessings. I usually get up around 6, 6.30, trying to work on sermons. Probably wondering when I'm going to get good at that, but coming down the stairs of these little six-year-old feet who just plops in my office, plops in my lap, doesn't care how busy I am, doesn't care about all I've got to do, just sits there and talks to me. And in about five minutes, I don't really care what I have to do anyway. Those are the, those are the rewards. Those are the blessings. Every chance you get, please. Put that little kid in your lap and let her talk. It's just wonderful. And we are in Samuel again. Sam. Last week we saw that the Amalekites were supposedly t totally destroyed and we tried to apply that. That same destruction destruction language, defeat language, holy war language is pulled over into the New Testament where God says, I want you to destroy. I want you to put to death. I want you to completely destroy the sin in your life. And we have to work on that. Amen? Amen. It's not easy. But we, we have to work on that. This morning we will see that Saul lost his kingship Basically because he disobeyed God. O obedience, an another theme you don't hear a lot about from pulpits. And yet it's so important that we understand that God wants us to be obedient. The interesting thing about what we're going to talk about this morning is that God is extremely pained by Saul's disobedience. He, he experiences, I believe what the text means, is that God actually experiences emotional pain because of this person that he loved and this person that he appointed to be king. So we're going to look at God's response, which was painful regret, I think. We're going to look at Samuel's response, which was just downright confusion. He really didn't, I don't think, understand what God was doing here. And then we'll look at Saul's sorrow. It didn't lead to repentance, but he was at least sorrowful. So let me begin by reading three or four verses here, okay? I'm going to read verse 10. I'm going to read verse 11. I'm going to read verse 29. And I'm going to read verse 35. And in each one of those verses, I'm going to put the word repent. Okay? Now your translation, if it's an ESV or a New Living Translation or the New King James Version, will not say repent. Okay? But I just want to emphasize that word for now, not because I want to park on that word, but I'm hoping to clear that word up if possible. Okay? So verse 10. Then the Lord, or the word of the Lord, came to Samuel. I repent that I've made Saul king because he turned away from me and has not carried out my instructions. Samuel was troubled and he cried out to the Lord all that night. Verse 29. 
He who is the glory of Israel does not lie or repent. I think you might have changed his mind. For he is not a man that he should repent or change his mind. And verse 35. Until the day Samuel died, he did not go to see Saul again. Though Samuel mourned for him. And the Lord was grieved that he had made Saul, or the Lord repented that he had made Saul king over Israel. Now this is a, I, I don't play or, or, or think I have all the answers here to this problem, okay? The problem is, does God change his mind? Does he go back on what he said? That's the problem. And critics love to, 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 to beat this theme to death, okay? Yeah, you can't count on God because he just changes his mind. He does what he wants to do and there's nothing you can do about it and so forth and so on, which is not true, by the way. Well, what is God doing here? Well, the Hebrew word is like many, many Hebrew words, many, many Greek words in the New Testament. It has all kinds of nuances and is used in all kinds of ways. And, and I think that's what confuses a, a lot of people. And yet we know that the Holy Spirit wrote this book, amen? Yeah, it's the Holy Spirit's book. So let's talk about some of the meanings of this word repent, which you have in your NIV grieved or regret if you have another version. It actually can mean sorry. So we could retranslate this word, God was sorry that he did that. It means regret, it means repent, it means change of mind. That's one conglomeration of what it means. Secondly, it means to grieve or to really feel emotional pain. So we could say that God really felt this, felt emotional pain. He was grieved at what, what, what Saul had done. And the fact that he had disobeyed God Again, the word can be used as comfort. Now, to be comforted. I don't think that's the meaning here, that God was comforted about this disobedience that Saul had. My, my feeling is that I really think that the word is best probably translated either grieved or regret. I think that basically God just regretted and felt this pain because of, the, of sin. The ESV, the New Living Translation, the New King James Version, they all translate regret. And so God, have you ever regretted something in your life? You know what that feels like, don't you? It's painful. Either something you did something someone else did. It, you know what it means to grieve. You know what it means to grieve when you lose someone. You know what it means to regret when you lose someone. And so that's the feeling that God is having here in this situation with Saul. And I always plan to take this off first, and I never do that. Problem. So anyway, what, what, do we, what can we learn from that? What can we, what, what does, what's the text trying to communicate to us here? Well, I think it's trying to communicate some, thing, communicate some things about God. First of all is this. That God is intensely, intensely sorrowed by sin. That, that he's pained when we disobey. Now, Joan, right, did the children's thing? Right, yeah, that was good, by the way, wasn't it? That was good. One of my favorite passages in all the Bible as well. I use it in every wedding. Every wedding, I use the same passage. So you don't, haven't you learned anything else? Yeah, I learned it. Just a great, you know, love is kind. 
Love is patient. Love is all those things. Husbands and wives, that's exactly the way we're supposed to be. Amen? Yeah. And when we're not, God is pained. He's pained when we disobey. So we need to know that, but we need to know that the God of the Bible is intensely involved with us. You're not just sitting up there going, you know, getting those reports from the angels that Frank blew it again. You know. Which, which he would have probably responded, yeah, and do we have to hear this again? You know. No. God is intensely involved with us. He, he's, he's not this cold slab of concrete impervious to our, can I call him, and I call them our carefully defended disobediences. <laughs> Isn't it amazing how carefully we defend ourselves when somebody catches us? Isn't it amazing? We're going to talk about that in a few minutes too. That we need to know that God is both tough and that God is tender. That he's firm and yet he's got feeling. That's the way God is. And so when, when we do, when we obey, guess what God does? He smiles, <laughs> if I may. And when we don't obey, guess what God does? He cries, if I may. Say, well, God can't cry. Oh, yes, God can cry. We know that from the life of Jesus, amen? We know it from the life of Jesus. So I want you to understand that God is intensely involved with you and with me. And sometimes God has to be very firm, like he was with the Amalekites. They had to go, folks. If you weren't here last week, you, you don't understand the, the horrendous cultural practices that you, you wouldn't just off the top of your head, think of anybody would be, even be able to, to do any of those things, let alone everybody, let alone everybody in the culture. They had, they had to be destroyed. And yet God can be very, 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 very loving and very, very kind. And, and we know that. Now I want you to turn, if you would, to Ephesians chapter 4. Because in Ephesians chapter 4, we're also told to not grieve the Holy Spirit. Which is the same thing as grieving God. But I want to begin reading at verse 25, if we could. Ephesians 4, 25. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to his neighbor. We're all members of one body. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you're still angry. And do not give the devil a foothold. He who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work. Doing something useful with his own hands that he may have something to share with those who are in need or with those in need. Do not let any, any, let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness and rage and anger and brawling and slander along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as in Christ God forgave you. Everything before verse 30 and the following verse, verse 31, they all bring pain to God's heart. Are you bitter? Have you been bitter for a long time? Are you angry? Is that an everyday thing in your life? 
Is there malice? Do you really want to get back at somebody? And do you give them a tongue lashing every time their name comes up? Those are the kinds of things that pain the heart of God. But not only do they hurt God, dear friends, if you're a Christian, they hurt the church. If you're a family member, they hurt your family. If you've got neighbors, they hurt your neighbor. That's, that's what sin does. It's not just a one-time thing, me against you or you against me. It just trickles down to everybody. And when God sees that, his heart is really pained. Second point, a troubled prophet, Samuel, a troubled prophet. Look at verse 11 again of chapter 15. Go back there. I'm sorry. I should have sent you back there a while ago. First Samuel 15, let's look at 11. We'll look at 35 and we'll look at chapter 16 and verse 1. At the end of verse 11, the Bible says Samuel was troubled and he cried out to the Lord all night. Now, if you cry out to the Lord all night, something's really bothering you, amen? Yeah, something has really gotten to your heart. Verse 35, until the day Samuel died, he did not go to see Saul again, though Samuel mourned for him. 16.1, and the Lord said to Samuel, how long will you mourn for Saul since I have rejected him from being king over Israel? Get back to what you're doing and supposed to be doing. Obviously, Samuel is upset. Sounds to me like he's a bit angry. Sounds like to me he's a bit confused. Who, who's he angry at? Who's he, who's he crying out at all night? It, is he angry with God? Is he angry with Saul? Is he angry about the situation? Now here we are again, sitting in the middle of Amalekites and, and all other Canaanites in the land with no leader. Is he mad about that? Confused about that? Is he seeking forgiveness for Saul? Protection of Israel? Is he praying for himself? Is he praying for courage? I got to get up tomorrow morning and go look in Saul's face and say to him, God's rejected you to being king. How'd you like that job? Most of us don't want to confront anybody. <laughs> it's not easy to confront people. Especially if they don't think they're supposed to be confronted. I think maybe all of those could have been something that he was praying about and crying out to God about. I think probably bottom line, this is one of the times in his life where I can't figure you out, God. I don't know what you're doing here. I don't get it. I can just hear him saying, you know, you know, when Israelites said they wanted a king, I said no. I told them this isn't a good thing. That's in chapter 8. But you, Lord, you said, yeah, give him a king. I want you to give him a king. Basically, you told me, Samuel, you're wrong. I'm giving them a king. So, okay. I said, I'll obey you, Lord. I'll, I'll give him a king. In fact, Lord, I, I announced to the entire country that he's the one you chose. I, I anointed him. I had a big special celebration for this guy. Not only that, every time you told me to tell him something, I went and I told him exactly what you wanted me to tell him. Was all that for naught? God, it's like everything I did was worthless. That could have been the way he was feeling. Have you ever been, <laughs> I started to ask, have you ever been hurt in the church? <laughs> I 
You know, it's like, you know, asking if you ever had the measles or something, you know. <laughs> yeah, we, we've all been hurt, haven't we? Somewhere along the line. That's because churches aren't perfect. The biggest problem with churches, they have people in them. <laughs> yeah? Just think how this would go if it was just you. Right, it just goes smooth as glass. But it's not. It's not. And it hurts when you get hurt. Sometimes the hurt's not your fault. Sometimes the hurt is your fault. And we'll talk about that a little later too. And if, you know, you got to possibly have a new pet. I was talking to, to Trinity and about the new guy coming. And John gave a good little speech there, John, for about being critical. If you're, if you're ever thinking about being a pastor... You think about being hurt. And you think about being hurt a lot. Because people will hurt you. And if you're in a church and you think it's the perfect church, you just made it imperfect. Yeah. I know that that, that hurts when, when, and I think Samuel is hurt. And his distress, you know, it's really not surprising that he's distressed. You know, every Sunday morning we pray, thy kingdom come. If we really mean thy kingdom come, if we're really yearning for the kingdom to come, then we'll be distressed when it's sabotaged. So it's no surprise that Samuel is distressed. He's distressed over the fact that here's the kingdom of God hurting again. Because of sin in a person's life. We should be that engaged, amen? We should be that engaged in the kingdom of God that when it is hurt, we hurt. And when there is brokenness, we're broken. And when there is sadness, we're sad. We should feel that like Samuel felt that. Now let's talk about Saul. Look at, um, look at verse 12. Early in the morning, Samuel got up, went to meet Saul, but he was told Saul had gone to Carmel where he set up a monument in his own honor and has returned and gone down to Gilgal. That's, that's a little dis disconcerting, isn't it? <laughs> Here's Saul. First of all, he doesn't destroy the Amalekites, and now he's going to set himself up an, you know, a big monument in honor for what he didn't do. <laughs> in honor for his disobedience, he sets up a monument. We'll probably come back to that maybe next week. When Samuel reached him, Saul said, The Lord bless you. I've carried out the Lord's instructions. So here's Samuel walking along thinking about, Oh, God, how do I do this? What am I going to do? His heart is heavy. His heart is broken. His heart is troubled. He's confused. And here's, here's Saul, all chipper. <laughs> you know, hey, good to see you, Samuel. I did it. You know, the funny thing is, is about the time he says, you know, I did all that. You know, all those, all those animals were going, bah. No. You know, right in the middle of that confession, here are the animals that he was supposed to kill. And he's standing there saying, I did what the Lord told me to do. How, how, how do we do that? How, how do we believe that we did something for the Lord and we didn't? How do we convince ourselves that we've been obedient when we haven't? Well, 
I think there's a couple of things we can talk about. First of all is this. Disobedience always has a rationale. It always has a rationale. And we've heard the arguments for this one, okay? Well, you know, what a waste of quality property. Look at this cattle. This stuff's ready for market. I mean, this, this, this cattle looks good. Look at these sheep. They're all healthy, you know. That's just a, a waste. Of, it, it's poor stewardship of God's blessings if we destroy these animals. Sounds pretty reasonable, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. That's just our rationale for our own disobedience. That's what that is. So disobedience has its rationale, and disobedience has its excuses. I'm going to give you the top three, okay? Top three excuses in our disobedience. The most typical ones people use when trying to defend their disobedience. Number one is this one. To set one's virtues over against one's disobedience. In Saul's case, it's this one. Well, look. I killed most everything. I, you know, look, look, look at what I did kill. I, I, you know, we, we killed all the bad stuff. And we kept, kept all the good stuff. I killed everything else. I had a pastor friend who had a businessman in his church. And he was breaking the law. He was breaking the law and the elders of the church went to him and confronted him about it. And he got offended. He was offended that they came to him and he said, you know, look, look at the jobs I gave some of those guys. I, I gave some guys some jobs and, and I've done a lot of good, good stuff here in the church. That was his excuse. Didn't matter he was breaking the law. Didn't matter he was doing something that he's guilty of. Didn't matter he was committing sin. He wanted them to immediately look at all the good things that he did. And that's what we do. Doesn't that sound reasonable, though? Oh, let's give the guy a break. You know, let's give him a break. That's excuse number one. We set one's virtues over against one's disobedience. The second one is this. We blame others for our failure. Now this one's as old as the Garden of Eden, amen? <laughs> the woman gave me that apple. Yeah. Let's blame her, you know. Let's blame her. We blame others. Saul said it's the soldiers. Yeah. But Samuel said, what then is this bleeding of sheep in my ears? What is this lowing of the cattle I hear? And, and Saul answered, the soldiers brought them from the Amalekites. They spared the best of the sheep and the cattle to sack. Listen, who's in charge of this army? Saul, not the soldiers. So he's trying to comp out on a little bit of his responsibility. He's the leader. He makes the choice of everything that gets destroyed. but he didn't even hold up that much of the bargain. And so we hear it every day. Husbands blame wives. Wives blame husbands. Children blame their parents. Parents blame the children. 90% of American divorcees say that divorce was the other spouse's fault. I've often heard people blaming the church for this or that that they have done. If they aren't happy, if they had a falling out with someone, if they have a critical spirit, it's the church's fault. We just naturally blame other people for all we do. I had a lady in the church in New Jersey Bless her heart. 
converted Catholic and Italian. Doesn't get any worse than that. Right? She wrote me a five-page letter about my humor. <laughs> I know. My, my humor is just, maybe it's too much. I don't know. I, I can get carried away, I'm, I'm sure. Five-page letter. You know. So I called her up and I said, Addie, her name was um, Adeline. Adeline Adonasio, pure and bred, right there. Called her in. She sat down. I said, you know, Addie, I said, thanks for the letter. I said, I realize I can, I can get carried away sometimes with humor. I said, but Addie, it's just me. It's, I'm this way when I'm not in the pulpit. I'm this way when I am in the pulpit. And, I, and I'm, I'm sorry that, you know, it hurt you. I said, but, you know, I don't want you to sit here every Sunday morning being unhappy. If you're going to be ha unhappy, you know, don't do that, okay? There's a lot of good preachers in this, in this state, you know, around where we live. You can, you know, she stayed in the church for 11 years. Yeah. Best evangelist. I ever had. Yeah. You know, when, when, when you get critical, and by the way, church leaders, when somebody gets critical about you, go see them. Do it humbly. Do it honestly. But do it it can change people, and it can change you. It really can. The third excuse is to place what I would call positive construction on our disobedience. Saul excuses the failure to destroy the Amalekites and the herds by claiming, and I'm not sure how true his claim was, it was probably a little more exaggerated than, than it needed to be. But he claimed that the animals were spared to be used for sacrifice. I, I'll tell you what, I'll give him the benefit of the doubt at this point, okay? How many times have uh, the harsh and unkind remark was uh, branded as speaking the truth in love? Yeah. How about the failure to share our faith? Well, that was just an instance of not, you know, casting our pearls before swine. Well, how about the fact that I, you know, I, okay, so I shaved a little off on my offering, you know, which means that basically the excuse is it's because, you know, I have responsibility to my family. Really? 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 Have you followed professional sports very much? Have you ever noticed that, that every time... <clears throat> Some athlete wants a little more money, which he's already getting more than he deserves anyway. It's always because he has to take care of his family. That's why I want to make a hundred million a year. I, you know, it's hard on a hundred million a year. You know, he probably should ask for a hundred and ten. You know, good grief. I remember the, the owner of the Baltimore Colts way back when uh, they had a, a strike on uh, and they had a strike in the football NFL and <laughs> he, he said that uh, he was happy 
happy about the first player strike because it made so many family men out of football players. <laughs> yeah, they all were worried about their family. Yeah. We see that in lawsuits. Nobody ever sues for the money, right? They just sue before justice and for the sake of others who might be injured just the same way I was. What's the conclusion here? The conclusion is simply this. Bottom line, God calls for nothing less than our total obedience. That's bottom line. Total obedience. Yeah. What's the key to that? I think the key to that is believing God. How difficult do you think it was for Saul to go and slaughter an entire culture? I'd like to say pretty darn difficult. But what was his problem? He didn't believe God. That's it. He just did not believe God. The, the key to obedience is trusting God. Did God say this? Okay. I, okay, I'll do it. I know it's hard, but I'm going to do it. By the way, is obedience hard? Say yes. Yeah. Yeah, obedience is hard. But let me tell you something. You want to be a happy Christian? You want to be a fulfilled Christian? Obey. You want to be an unhappy Christian? You want to be an unfulfilled Christian? Don't obey. God never, ever tells us to do something wrong. And not only that, everything he tells us to do is good for us. Don't ever forget that. He never tells us to do something wrong, and whatever he tells us, it's good for us. So I encourage you today to obey God. Ask him for the strength to do that. Let's pray. Father, that's what we need, your strength. We can't do this on our own. Many times what you ask us to do, we don't want to do. It's hard for us. Different things, Lord, are hard for different people. But we pray. Oh, God, we pray. Give, just give us faith in you. To trust you. To do whatever we, you ask us to do. In Jesus' name. Amen. Everyone stand and we'll sing a closing song. Our God is an awesome God.